hi and welcome to to the next episode of the Foss North podcast. To today we have Olaf with us. So, who are you? Hello. Uh, so yeah, I am uh, Olaf Schingren. I am uh, working as an uh, FPJ and uh, embedded designer. Been doing that for twelve years now. Uh, I am also very very involved in open source silicon, which is what we're going to talk about more today. Uh, so I'm the co-founder and director of the Fossil Foundation. I am also a member of Chips Alliance and the Risk Five ambassador. And apart from the more outreachy parts of my work, I also uh, run some open source silicon projects like uh, the award-winning Tusok, uh, Edelice, uh, Serve, and Swarwolf would probably be what I'm most known for. Cool. Yeah, one thing you mentioned before we got started was the the difference between open hardware and open source silicon because you're in the the open source silicon business, so to speak. Yes, that's correct. So, uh, open source silicon is often um, bundled into the open hardware space, but it's it's a bit different. So, open hardware is usually what we when we talk about PCB uh, circuit board designs, we talk about three D printers and, and physical things. Uh, open source software, yeah, that's about programming code. Open source silicon is, you can say it's about microchip design. It's about the tools and the code that goes into making a microchip. So it's FPGAs, but also ASICs to some extent. Yes, that's correct. So both FPGA and ASIC. And uh, FPGA is in many ways very similar to software and, and ASIC design has Part of it, which is very similar to software, and part of it, which is very similar to hardware. But this is also why we have, we need to have some special focus on this space because it's it's not hardware and it's not software. Yes, it ends up in between. And I mean, they, I mean, we've touched on on uh, on open licenses in in this series before, but I, I think the Fossil Foundation does licensing, but you do other stuff as well. So, could you tell us a bit more about the the whole setup there? Yeah, so we started Fossil Foundation because we thought there was a need for a vendor independent body to uh, promote and assist open source silicon uh, within the industry, in academia, and for hobbyists alike. Um, so we formed Fossil Foundation in 2014 and it was unveiled in 2015. Uh, so we, we, had, uh, we have a manifesto and we have uh, some high reaching goals that we want to uh, fulfill. Uh, and one of them was to have have places for people to meet to make sure that there are uh, areas for collaboration where people can can work together and come together uh, and share uh, what they know and help new people. Uh, one other thing was the uh, technical foundation, and this is both the tools uh, and and the code and also licenses because that was one of the big gaps that we saw that uh, there existed licenses. Uh, most of them were very much written for software. And when we looked at it close enough, it was not applicable for, for this domain. Yeah, I guess the, the, the FPGA makes it extra interesting since it's almost software. So, Yeah, but then you have, uh, like in the GPL license, you have things like static linking. What is static linking when it comes to, uh, to FPGA? And what is static linking when it comes to ASIC? So it's, it's many things like these. That's, that's Common example, but not the only one. So, did you develop any licenses within the Fossil Foundation, or did you basically select licenses that you recommended? Uh, so, what we did was that we formed a licensing committee, uh, and then we tried to get on board all the people who uh, were interested in this, and all the people who were already looking at this. And, and this is very much the work we do within Fossil Foundation. We try to bring people together, uh, serve as a, as a uh, place where, where they can collaborate. So CERN had uh, been looking at open uh, hardware licenses. Uh, we had some other people like uh, Andrew Katz uh, had been looking at open hardware licenses. Uh, so uh, there, there were some different efforts and we kind of coordinated a bit uh, within Fossil Foundation and with the licensing committee tried to keep the key people involved, basically. So last year, there were two very interesting announcements. Uh, and the first one was the uh, solder pad license, which has been updated now to cover uh, open source silicon development. Uh, 
The solder pad license is in use by the Pulp ecosystem uh, from ETH series and uh, also in use in Open Hardware Group, which is a consortium around uh, open source silicon. Uh, SolarPad is now under governance of Fossil Foundation. Uh, we didn't develop it, but we are we are uh, governing the standard now. And the other one is from CERN, and it's the version two of the CERN OHL licenses. And they have created three licenses. And this was very much what we wanted to see from Fossil Foundation side. We wanted to see a fully permissive. We wanted to see a weak uh, copy left, and we wanted to see a strong copy left license that all worked for chip design. And this is exactly what CERN has done. They created these three licenses. I don't remember the exact names of it. It's like dash S and dash L or something like that. Uh, but you can look it up. Uh, so I, I think that from, from that point, we are actually covered. We have a good situation where we can have usable and applicable licenses uh, that work for, for chip design, which is fantastic. How does how do they differ from a software license? Is it is it mostly that you redefine like how you put things together, so replacing the linking concepts and things like that, or what's the major differences? So the, the permissive licenses are very similar, uh, and also I would say I, I'm I have not been part of this committee myself, so I I don't have the exact details, but I have been following the development a bit, uh, so I think that. You have things like system libraries, which is a definition in, in the GPL licenses. And you kind of word that in, I mean, in chip design, you also have, you have the vendors, the the chip factories, the, the, the fabs uh, that create actual chips, they have uh, something called a PDK, which is a process development kit. Uh, and this describes how to, how the, how the actual gates are implemented and, and what rules apply for for spacing between transistors and things like that uh, deep down the really physical side of, of things uh, so these are things that up until last year there were no open pdks so you had to rely on a pdk from a from a asic fab so this would be kind of the uh, equivalent to a system library in in uh, so on the software side so it's Wording that that fits the uh, how chips are are made better uh, than, yep. than the software licenses. Also, there's a I mean there's a separate uh, laws around uh, chip design. We have the I don't know which year it's from, but it's called the the Mask Act, I think, uh, which is uh, for for when you do an ASIC, uh, you, you shine some 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 light uh, and you have a, a mask which controls which areas of the chip that are uh, get that uh, the light shines on, uh, and this mask is one of the most proprietary things you will find in chip design. They are extremely expensive, and there are separate laws that handle how how things around them. Uh, so it's 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 a very specific area. Another aspect, I guess, that you run into more than software, uh, at least outside of the US, would be patent. Um, do, are are the permissive licenses a, like BSD style where you don't care, or is that something that's sort of handled by these licenses? That's correct. That's a very uh, important thing. Uh, so uh, patents very much apply in a different way, uh, and it's much more important when it comes the closer your hardware you come. And there, of course, there's the gray zone here when it comes to FPGAs, which is kind of software <laughs> uh, and and ASICs. Um, so there are different approaches to this, uh, but I think most of the licenses are uh, include patent grants. So, for example, many people in the uh, many people use Solarpad, which has uh, a patent grant clause, uh, and also the Apache license is becoming very popular because of this. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what what it looks like in the CERN licenses. Well, that's good. That's a topic for for another time. We we need to talk talk to Javier again. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking here. The uh, over the years, I, I, I've been in the free software uh, area for, for so many years, and when, when talking to to my like normal friends, that is non hacker, I have a really hard time explaining what software is, what software development is, and what it 
free software, open source licenses. I mean, this must be a hell for you. It is, but uh, there, there are so many things that are hard to explain about what I do. So, <laughs> <laughs> so can, can you? Can, what does your kid say? What, what does daddy do? Um, he sits by the computer, which is, I mean, <laughs> my, 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 in my, my normal, my daily routine is is very much like programming. So, uh, when when you develop when you develop chips, it's I would say it's it's ninety nine percent programming. Uh, and then in the end, you convert it to a physical thing, but that is often done by someone else. So it's it, from a from a my high perspective. I mean, it's it's it looks very much like software design, although you have much more expensive and extremely much worse tools to work with. Uh, it's like it's like doing the software development in the eighties, basically. Mm. Machine code, <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean, a lot of when, when we come to licensing and all of that, I, I guess a part. Sometimes you develop stuff, like you talk about your projects. So, so you develop these IP blocks or, or sort of components, but then I guess you do a lot of integration as well when you want to go to a product. So, so taking UARTs or 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 whatnot and then put them together with a CPU core on a piece of silicon. Um, is that do do you have a good way to handle like the proprietary open boundaries there, or is that a problem? I mean, for in some cases, an FPGA comes with hard blocks for certain things, and yeah. and those must then be considered proprietary software or sort of components at least. Yeah, so I would say that is why that's a good reason why we have these new licenses because they need to uh, adapt to this reality. So when we talk about software licenses, I think at least we talk, have having a boundary. For example, a library could be a boundary. And in the same equivalent thing in uh, in chip development is the IP core. So IP here is for intellectual property, uh, which is, a, it's a, it's not a very good name because it kind of implies that this is something that uh, is, is named from a business perspective, not from a functional perspective. But it, it is, a IP core is a functional unit, like a UART, like a, a FFT hardware accelerator or something like that, or a processor, which is also an IP core. Um, so there are, I mean, just like in software, uh, you can have uh, GPL-like or strong copyleft uh, IP cores. These uh, create uh, additional restrictions on, on, on their environment uh, that they can often only be uh, used together with uh, other uh, IP cores. Uh, some companies use this as a, as a way to do a license. Uh, their offerings, they have a proprietary license and have a GPL, uh, GPL license or GPL-like license. Uh, that will be, for example, one of the new CERN licenses. Uh, but I know that when I started out, many people used the LGPL for IP cores, uh, which is not applicable, but the intent was to that they wanted people to make modifications to that IP core, uh, but still allow it to exist in with proprietary uh, other proprietary cores inside the chip. Uh, so these some of these new licenses are written to handle that intent. I would say. This so is this kind of boundary we have. Weak copyleft license, basically. Yes. It, it's it's hard for me to understand how and uh, like how how all this happens. So can you describe like what you do on a on, on a working day, more more than just sitting in front of your computer? So how do you develop the hardware? How how does it get from your desktop to the like uh, factory? Yeah, so uh, much of my development I do is targeting FPGAs. Uh, so what I do is that I create, I write program code in, in uh, often Verilog, which is one of the main languages for doing a, uh, digital design. Uh, in Verilog, you describe the functionality of of what you want to what you want the chip to do. 
Uh, and then I either run this in a simulator to see that it behaves as I expected, or I convert this into a binary form, uh, which can be uploaded to the FPGA chip. So an FPGA is a very special type of chip, which is reprogrammable. Uh, it's basically, you can see it's a bit of a Lego that uh, you have you have a lot of building blocks and, and you basically describe how these are connected. And, and in that sense, you can form uh, almost anything as long as, as long as you have enough <laughs> Lego bricks to do it. <laughs> um, so, so this is that that would be a normal routine for me uh, to do this. So you run that. And, sorry, and then you run that through a simulator, so you can see that it all like works. And what what happens? How does it become hardware? Well, when in FPGA, I would say it never becomes hardware. It what you end up with is a configura configuration file for a specific uh, FPGA device, which uh, tells the FPGA how to form form the connections, but it's it's only software. It's like it's like setting switches uh, uh, in the in the chip. You you fill the memory and in, in the chip, and and you set some switches to to control how the signals flow between them. Um, in an ASIC, this, it, it would be different. I would still write the si same kind of programming uh, code. I would still write Verilog code uh, most often. Uh, this time, it would be. I would use a tool called a synthesis tool, uh, which convert this to, you can say, graph of of, uh, of uh, more like electrical components such as adders and and uh, and an OR gates and um, uh, yeah. if you have done any digital design, you will, you will recognize these like multiplexers and, and things like that. Uh, so this is still an abstract uh, kind of intermediate representation language, uh, which is called a netlist. It describes. The, the connection between all these logical elements. Uh, the next step is to convert these into uh, into gates and into transistors, into cells. Uh, and, and, and at that point, you start to do something. You start to, to map these into the actual silicon and metal and, and uh, what you find, find in the actual chip. Uh, and it gets a bit more complicated by that point, but but then that is kind of blueprint for how how to make the chip. Uh, and if you actually build a chip, build an ASIC, then you will after that uh, you will end up with something called a, a GDS file, which is a file that just like in in if you have done a circuit board, you have you have these Gerber files, which describes uh, each layer of the PCB. It describes uh, what the copper and, and, and the other materials. Uh, I'm not very good at PCB design. Yeah. Um, but but like that, you, just, uh, you describe how the layers of metal and, and silicon uh, should be built up. Uh, and these form, from that you, you uh, create the masks and then you send it to the, to the fab to do the chip and it will do a lot of, Chemistry and, and, and physics and uh, <laughs> very small nanometer things, and you get the chip back. Okay, cool. And hopefully it works. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we talked a bit about building blocks. I mean, uh, one of the projects that you were, were showing last time I met you was the, the FUSOC, like the, the package manager of, of IP cores uh, that you're building. Maybe we should dive in there a bit. Yeah, so it kind of also comes a bit of, of the col collaborative side. So I, I, I like collaboration a lot, and there are so much good stuff out there. Uh, there has been way too little collaboration. So you have all these IP cores which exist in isolation. Uh, you have typically you what what you do is is kind of that you 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 just copy the source code of each and every IP core in, into like a giant directory and and then. Mm -hmm. And then you, you you start building up your chip from that, and that is how we did software a long time ago. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't scale uh, nowadays. We use apt or we use other package managers to just we say I focus on my top level, and then I just bring in the dependencies. Uh, and this is what Fusoc aims to do. It creates a common uh, format for describing IP cores, 
so that the tools will know what to do with them. It describes the relations, the dependencies between IP cores. So you can build up, just like in software, you can build up a, a graph of, of IP cores. Um, and chip design is very hierarchical. Uh, so it, it leans very well towards this kind of methodology. And also, <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> uh, one one uh, thing that is also different between software and, and hardware development or chip design is that in, in software development, you use, for example, you use GCC or, or LLVM to, to compile your design. Uh, and you use maybe some tools for checking. In the silicon space, we have so many tools. Each FPGA vendor have their own tool flow, which is compatible with everyone else's. And we have tons of different simulators. We have tons of different tools. So uh, one of my main projects, which is kind of a backend part of USOC, is called Edelize. And that is just an abstraction layer for EDA tools. And it currently, as of yesterday, it has 26 different backends. So it supports now 26 different EDA tools. Uh, and this is just, that's also, also a problem because before this, before having that kind of abstraction, uh, you can't really collaborate easily because one group uses one type of simulator, another uses another type of simulator. And when you want to use the other group's course, you need to rewrite all these configuration files to see, fit your simulator, which is, um, yeah, it's, it's lots of time uh, goes on to these kind of things. So the actual sort of very long code, the source code is, is always shareable, but the, the whole configuration around them is, is sort of platform specific. Yeah, much of it is shareable. And just like in, in, in software in, in C, for example, you might be calling some uh, very specific, uh, some some features that are specific for this hardware, but generally you, you just write code that is uh, generally applicable. Yeah. Does it also generate like, some of the interconnections, or, or do do you only get the company the components and then you have to put them together? Or I mean, if if you pull in a component consisting of multiple smaller ones, is it handwritten code the integration, or can it sort of connect things to a bus and, and build the whole silicon from you? That's a very common question, uh, and it doesn't. Uh, but there is kind of a plugin structure, uh, something I call generators, uh, which intends to solve that. So. That you can you can have a generator that actually uh, so if you, if you describe each of these cores uh, and in the top level describe the connections, you, you can do this as a as a sort of plugin I would say to to Fusoc, but it's it doesn't exist yet, uh, but it's it, that's the way we would handle it. Uh, I don't want to add this functionality into Fusoc because uh, it will make it much harder to maintain and, and develop the other things. So basically one tool for, for that part and one tool for, for getting the components. The, the this is way. all strange. To, so to my audio the... dropped out now, I'm sorry. Um, I'm back. You're back? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so basically two tools. That's the Unix way. That's, that's, yeah. that's the way it's meant to be, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. I remember I mean... a discussion we had on a bus uh, uh, for a company I work with, like 99 something. And I, I read a notice that perhaps it was Bruce Parents or someone starting some something with open hardware. And I remember the discussions then. Yeah, it, it's cute what you do with free and open source software, <laughs> but this ain't gonna fly when it comes to your hardware. And when hearing your like definition or description of USOC, it's exactly what they thought would never happen. So again, it happened from like a community effort. And uh, like it's it's kind of magic. Yeah, and there are there are things, other things happening uh, right now that uh, last year actually that uh, we have been waiting for 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 twenty years that are super mm -hmm. exciting, and I would love to talk about more. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a secret, or can we do uh, one more episode? We can do one more episode about okay, that. Okay, cool. So There's cool. no secrets, just... Uh, oh, and we have a cliffhanger. Yes. And we have yeah. a cliffhanger. <laughs> Amazing, because we, we are slowly running out of time. Uh, but then we will talk to you next week again. So so thank you for this time, and, and see you around. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye.